Thank you guys for having me once again. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces out there, uh, teachers and students and so forth. Uh, nice big crowd too, I like this. It, uh, this is becoming more popular. I'm liking to see uh, uh, Asia become an AUB powerhouse. Um, so uh, I'm uh, the senior uh, R&D engineer for Mukimbari, and I'm also an adjunct professor at Santa Clara where I teach robotics and uh, so forth. So uh, if you guys have questions all the way through this or anything like that, just raise your hand. There's no problem at all. A um, little bit about where I work. Uh, so in Monterey Bay in California, and this was the man who founded the place. Some quick information. These slides I'm going to give to them again this year, so I won't worry about spending too much time on these things. I'm going to get right into the robots and so forth for you. Um, so I'm going to talk about the past, the immediate uh, uh, things I'm working on, and then some of the future things that I'm working on, and why they're important. And I think you guys are the future. There's a lot of opportunities in the ocean besides getting to come back to Singapore every year, uh, have fun with my friends. Um, there's a lot of things you can do, and I've been everywhere. I spent three months in Antarctica, I just got back in two months in Germany. So the opportunities besides engineering for you in the world are actually quite big. It's a great place to go, so I, I push that on you there. Um, so this is one of the vehicles I started off with uh, many years ago called the Altex vehicle. Um, it was an under ice mission looking at this mystery heat loss of, of 11 terawatts of energy. So this is what's melting the North Pole. Right now you can know it's becoming very important. There's gonna be a lot of work up there as the Northwest Passage becomes open where people can go around that way as opposed to going through the Panama Canal. So a lot of science and engineering is going up into the, the snowy areas. So it's, uh, this was a little bit about the vehicle and what it could do. But I'll get more into the things that were more important about what it could do um, in just a second here. And so here you go, it's a collaboration with MIT and Mbari. So this is one of the great things about this engineering profession too, is when you do these vehicles, you meet a lot of cool people and you get to work in some great places. So uh, you know, if you're in Russia, you're probably meeting some guys from Thailand here and so forth, you become lifelong friends. And so that's great, you're gonna exchange some ideas. This vehicle though, happened to spin out and become a company. So the patent, I have a patent on the little blue ring in the back, which is a ducted tail cone, and I'll show you some pictures of that. Um, and so then this company was formed. Uh, my company, uh, and Barry made a lot of money, and I got a little bit. So I buy my buddy some gear, so it was nice. But, um, but you get the you get the idea here, um, and, and it's uh, pretty cool when you see things get picked up by the world and, and taken off on you. So some of the details about this. So the science sensors, right? This is where it all comes down to for my work. So if you look at that nose, you'll see there's quite a lot of instrumentation in there. The big white thing at the back with the black disc on top, that's an acoustic sensor looking up at the ice. And this was to replace the big submarines the Americans used for looking at ice signals. So we did some experiments with this small robot to replace these massive expensive assets. Um, at the front of it, you'll see there's some two little sort of tannish looking things between the white lumps, which are syntactic foam. And that's uh, dual CTDs, those two uh, seabird CTDs. Um, and that was because when you do things that are so remote, you have to have a backup instrument. So uh, I always make a joke about this where a man with one watch always knows the time for sure, and a man with two watches doesn't know for sure. So I always argue with the scientists about having two of these because they have different answers, which one's right. But anyway. Um, down below, you'll see there's a little door that popped open. And this was one of the coolest things about this instrument. So what we did there is we made these little buoys up the top. So these buoys were a little instrumented autonomous vehicle of their own. Um, they were compacted down, and that blue cylinder in the middle was a CO2 cartridge. And what that would do is you would launch it from the bottom because it was buoyant, so it gets pushed out, and then the counterweight to it being buoyant would be dropped also, so a little lead ball would fall to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, don't tell anybody you're not supposed to drop lead in the ocean. Um, but it was the Arctic, so what the hell. Uh, anyway, so uh, a little computer in there and so forth. Um, that yellow piece that you see at the back with the rod going through it, that's syntactic foam. So this thing would pop out and would go up backwards. It would hit the bottom of the ice, and then it would time out. The CO2 cartridge would pop, pull that rod out, and extend the double length so it was still buoyant. But now the buoyancy switched over and it would flip around very slowly. You'd eject this, uh, CO2, the, the yellow pieces. So then the black piece at the very top would start pumping water into that. That's a lithium pellet. So we'd go into a, a little bag that had this lithium pellet and put oil, keep it from going off. 
And then we create a jet stream. And that jet stream would pump right through the ice. <coughs> this thing would go about a meter and a half up. And then the, when the top got out, out of the water, uh, I mean out of the ice, uh, it was timed out. There's a little hollow place there between the purple and the green at the top. There was a, a, a bag and pen in there. This thing would take the excess CO2, blow out this little nose cone, and there was a GPS antenna and then an Argos antenna to download the data. So and this worked great. It's an awesome little, awesome little thing. It was awesome just to watch it work. Below, right, was a different thing. <laughs> so this was a pressure tolerant fuel cell that we tried to build. So this is a lot of power. So this is 400 watts continuous for two weeks <coughs> at 48 volts. Um, and pressure tolerant was the key to this. So this was a big, big project. Um, and if you look over here, you'll see that it didn't work out so well. So what happened is the byproducts of this were oxygen and, and hydrogen. They came together inside a motor. Um, and then we have what we call a, a large impulsive force happening in the ocean. Uh, we call it an explosion. <laughs> so, um, we did that because of the sanctuary. So our report to the sanctuary was it had an impulsive force. It's true. Um, but you can see what happened. This is at, this is at uh, 1,000 meters. This thing pumped, just busted the whole side out of this thing. And we dumped a bunch of chemistry and whatnot. Uh, but eventually it's, it floated back up with the weight of the aluminum and stuff. The waste products came out. So we got a thumbs up at the top and a thumbs down at the bottom. The point of this is, when you're doing this kind of work and you're creating these vehicles, you're going to have these days. But you learn from every one of them. So in your competition here, some of you are brand new to it. You're going to see right away who's had experience. Don't be afraid of that. Once you're the experienced guys, people are going to come to you and look at you. So steal their ideas and get better. That's what you do. All right. So here's what my job is. And your job, too, since you're in the ADD business. We're trying to take AEVs and push them out into all this tax, tax complexity and to in power sense, not so much get power, but use it better and whatnot, and start to make AEVs move out into doing sampling and so forth. ROVs have moved way out into here, and now the AEVs are moving in, and I just got back from two months working on a glider that's got a very large payload, and I think the gliders are going to change also. This is not a stagnant business at all. I was telling about my little tail cone. So the tail cone has two axes, a little gimbal. You're used to gimbals and whatnot from school. So I came up with a different idea because I'm working on the ice for two weeks. Sometimes now it's going to be for months. Uh, that's the way the industry would like to go for oil and so forth. When it freezes over, they want to be up there forever. So they want to have permanent presence. What do you do when something breaks? My idea was you take away the gimbal, which becomes a lock, if one of those actuator breaks, and you add three actuators. So now you create what I call an artificial center. So where that red line and, and the blue and the yellow cross and whatnot, it can, it, that's the range you can move between. So if any one of those actuators fails, I could reset the center and remap my controls. This is the kind of thinking that gets you to move ahead and push these things out further. And I got a graduate student out of it. He got a degree. Now he's working for Liquid Robotics, which makes the, uh, he's the lead engineer, uh, mechanical engineer for Liquid Robotics. You guys are familiar with wave gliders? So if you're familiar with those, look them up. If you're not, um, he's got a pretty cool job. And I uh, have a lot of fun with that. <coughs> so that's the real system up the top. That's a, the actuators are models of the ones that we use at sea, really. Um, and so we got more space back. We got more reliability, uh, less weight, um, and less power. So it was actually a win on all fronts. Um, docking. So this is another one that's coming back. We did these docks back in the 90s. Uh, this was one that was in the early, early 2000s. Um, but now because of cables starting to go underneath, especially at the North Pole and whatnot, for oil companies and that, and having this permanent presence, uh, the docking business is starting to come back, is what I'm seeing. So there's an entire thing of support for AEVs also that's coming back to you guys. There's all these other paths. Um, I have friends up in the north of uh, Scotland who've made ROVs, uh, made AEVs, I'm sorry, that look like ROVs. Um, they're sort of dual purpose things. They go out and turn the valves and manipulate and so forth. So they don't have to look like big tubes or anything as some of yours are. They look square and whatnot. They work just fine. So this manipulation thing is becoming a big deal. Um, and then the other one that's coming along also is multi-robots. So robots that each have functions and work together and, and collaborate. So, uh, but this docking thing is starting to come back pretty big, especially when I look at the oil and the uh, in, uh, Navy uh, type applications. So not all autonomous under not all autonomous vehicles have to be underwater. That's the other part of it. So I had some students that were all undergraduate students. 
Um, and I broke this up into pieces over the years. So one student could do one piece, and another student could do another piece. Uh, do you guys have capstone projects to graduate? That's what we call them. So you have to build something and then show that you know your engineering skills and do a report. So that's what this was for affected students. So this was the cartoon I started out with, saying, hey, this is what I want. That one up at the top, uh, that's where they actually ended up being the red. There was a yellow version of it prior, but he, uh, the guy, the Canadian kid there, uh, downsized it and painted it red. I guess he's Canadian, he might have read. So, um, that's working in Lake Tahoe, um, and that's working in Monterey. As you can see, it can take quite a good um, bit of waves. This is a swap boat, so it's quite stable. It's a small water plane area twin hull, completely autonomous. Um, and it started doing underwater mapping missions for the, uh, the uh, USGS, the United States Geological Survey System. And so these guys got paid to go up to Lake Tahoe and work. Um, they have a nice cabin and, and so forth for a week. It's all taken care of. So it's a pretty cool job. And that's what some of these maps look like. Um, over here is the reservoir where we practiced and started making the maps early on. Um, in the middle here, this is the actual rubble field that happened. They found uh, this rubble field up in Lake Tahoe. Um, and what this is, there was a tsunami at some point in history where the mountains collapsed in an earthquake, the boulders fell into the, the uh, lake and created a tsunami wave that went and washed over California somehow. Um, and it left this rubble field. And so they've had a lot of papers and, and scientific publications out of this. And now we're taking the boat um, and starting to do use it to, the sub hull, uh, do shallow water 3D uh, topography and whatnot. So it's starting to you know, do some other tasks and so forth. And it's pretty cool. Um, the other thing it's doing also, and I didn't put any pictures up here, is we have uh, three kayaks uh, that we have working with it, so it's starting to get into multi-vehicle operation. The kayaks swim around the uh, AUV uh, in a circle, and then when the threat is detected, let's say the boat is coming in towards the, 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 the uh, swap boat to see what it's doing, um, the kayaks will form a wall autonomously, and then as that boat goes by, they'll keep that wall moving, and then once the threat is gone, go back into a uh, survey boat. So if you want that paper, you can, I can get you that. Uh, that was done by Chris Kitts and some students of mine. So now, um, this is the most expensive vehicle I've built in AUVs. This is uh, the left there is the multi-beam AUV. Um, that was about, um, in the US dollars, and this was maybe 10 years ago, about $3.5 million, so a lot of money. Um, but you can see the kind of maps it makes now. And these are the best maps currently being made that I know of. Um, this is less than one, uh, one meter resolution. So you take about, I don't know, these four tiles right here, or eight tiles maybe. Um, so each pixel up there is smaller than that. And vertically, it's about 10 centimeters of resolution. So we've got tremendous, tremendous uh, resolution over, this is probably about a 60 kilometer run. Uh, by something on the order of 15 to 20 kilometers wide. Now the white spots are where the acoustics drop out. So you've got a bad return, or there's a ledge hanging over. These things can be turned three-dimensionally, so they're, they're, you can't see underneath. You know, so you get the white spot when you turn it, and so forth. So that's why those are there. But they're a true representation. And this is, this is fairly recent in, a, in underwater work. And now uh, Woods Hole um, and uh, the Germans and some other people are imitating these kinds of systems uh, because of the work that's been done. So where are we going with this? This is what's happening today. So if you look, that strip at the top is a, a camera mosaic that was put together on one of these vehicles, the one here on the right's cartoon of it. And we have a bed thick crawler, so it's another kind of subterranean uh, sub sub uh, AUV. This one happens to be a tractor goes along and does a bunch of mud work looking at oxygen depth and so forth. So it was flying along. We purposely had it fly over the top of this uh, with some good navigation. Um, and then this crab had crawled on the top of it. So this is a 2.8 meter vehicle. So you can see where that, that swap is something on the order of about uh, three or four meters wide. The mosaic is almost seamless, so the photography is actually quite good. Then you blow it up. You get under the crab. That's a 20 centimeter king crab. And then I get down and I blow it up and I can actually get a resolution of a two millimeter whisker off this crab. This is flying at about one and a half knots. So it did pretty well. So 
So what does that get us? Well, if we had this new thing that began in 2011, as you can see sometimes these things take a while. They're still not there. But we're going for one centimeter resolution now on the topography, two millimeters of resolution in the topography. So we're going to integrate all this data and put it together in one package so that you can get a, a, a visual and three-dimensional construction at a very high resolution. This is being done for sediment transport and some other things that scientists want. Um, I think oil companies are probably going to want this too when they get to certain problems and there'll be quite a lot of employment there. So this is what it looks like. This is the system at the top in the early days. We no longer have the lights hanging out at the sides. That was a, an early thing. Um, but if you look here where we're going, this is the way the cameras are going. So we've gone from uh, DVDs and 1080p and whatnot. So we're at 4K is uh, what we're using. Now there's even bigger than that today, but we're stopping at 4K because one mission with the acoustics and the video uh, will bring back something on the order of a terabyte and a half. And so the bigger problem now with underwater vehicles is actually the data system. So there's an entire thing that happen in your life where managing what we call big data today uh, is, is a major, major problem. And I think some of you should focus on that as a career. It'll be a big job. Um, we don't know what to do with it. It actually takes us longer to download the data than to do the mission sometimes. You know? <laughs> it's very expensive, by the way. Um, so this is what we're doing to get that high resolution. It's a laser line scanner. So we're using the multi-beam that was on the other vehicle you saw. With the, the, they use the big, big maps. Then we add the laser line scan on top of it to get the high resolution, and then the photography on top of that. So these data sets are integrated into one. Um, this is a, a prototype that's been done. We're actually having a very custom one built for us that'll give us a 150 degree swap, which is, I can't tell you the details on that, but um, it's a proprietary thing that we've asked for. But it's working pretty good. And so we're out testing that this year. And here's what you get. So probably not that important to you, but on the left was 2013 at one site, and we went back, and then we went back and, and did the photography again in 2014. This was a little bit lower res camera back then. But if you look, you can see the small changes in the photography. But when you use the laser line scanner over here, you can actually see the path that the clams went walking along the floor. Those scratches that you see there are actually animal tracks from the clams moving. So you don't catch that in photography, really. But that's why we're doing this. Why you want to trace clams walking, I don't know. But that's my job. <laughs> I can only tell you that's what it is. Um, another one that we're moving into. So adaptive sampling. So now that you've got autonomous vehicles out there, you can do new things that you couldn't do before. So you kind of set these things off with a program, and, and I guess you could call it partially AI or artificial intelligence. It's not really. But um, they're getting pretty smart. And so one of the big things we're looking for today is a, kind of a function of uh, global change. We seem to be seeing a lot more red tides and so forth. I think there's India. I think I can talk about off of India. I thought you were seeing too. Uh, off the west coast of California and Oregon, we're seeing a lot of growth in these, these poisonous uh, clouds of, of microbes and, and so forth. This particular one over here, Sudaniche, is the one that uh, the shellfish poison you know, that kills people and so forth. And eat it. And then we get birds killed and fish. So what we've done over the years, we used to make robots on the left there, which we still do, but we don't, we're not really focused on them as much anymore. That was an entire genetic lab that would go in the ocean. So it doesn't look like an AUV to you, but it really is. So it's an entire genetic lab. You bring in the samples, it breaks down the RNA and the DNA, it runs it over the tag, it fluoresces it on a, on a particular kind of uh, filter, and then it sends that information back done to us, and we just have to read the filter. So it's all done out in the ocean by a robot. Um, now we're putting it inside a 12-inch AUV. It's a, a long-range AUV at a barry. And so this was the first cartoon of it. And what's funny is you can see that they tried to keep this sort of circular carriage kind of concept they had started with. This is what happens with engineers, right? You've got something that's working, you're afraid to sort of abandon it and move on. Um, it turned out when you tried to do that, it was difficult. So this is what we're actually not doing. We'll say we're not doing. Uh, that's the vehicle at the top. This was the second generation idea about how to make it more linear and long and how to deal with this and so forth. 
Uh, this one at the bottom is actually a, a, a bio counter. It's not a, a not the actual. It's a different instrument. Uh, that one's already been done and working. But this over here is this this uh, genetic sample that's done in a different way. This is how it fits in the vehicle. Now you'll see a third generation design where it's a carousel that's on its side. So you get a sense of the scale of this whole thing and whatnot. And that's the actual device now. So this is a, in the lab falling apart. But we're, uh, we're now running these things at sea. We passed some uh, pretty good tests. Uh, the, the basic mechanics worked at the end of 2014. This year, they started doing the sampling and whatnot. End of 2015, and we're now shipping them uh, to do a joint project with Hawaii. So this year, they'll pretty much be pretty fully functional. So you're looking at about a six-year development to make this instrument happen in a vehicle. And that's the kind of thing that you can expect. It's not a, not a fast process all the time. OK, so what are you doing? And you notice I put a little girl up there because I think girls should be in engineering. How many women are here, by the way? Nobody's a girl here? <laughs> All right. I like girls. Uh, so um, here's some new ideas. These are the things that we're not doing yet that I think we should be looking at. If you look at the left here, this is the natural form that happens in cyclone. And it turns out you the thing on the right there, that's a silver-looking cyclone, is actually a very, very efficient propeller. Nobody I know of right now is trying to put these in an ADV, but this could be a great way to propulse at a huge efficiency. So you can actually pull yourself through the water. Are you doing it? Uh, huh? A startup idea. A startup idea. Another one is, if you look, sharks. There's something unique about sharks, and you don't have to really understand it, but it's something to do with the way their skin is done. But they never get barnacles. Whales get barnacles, fish get diseases on their skins and so forth and growths. Sharks for some reason do not. So they're starting to make artificial skin like sharks um, to try and get around biofouling. It's a huge area that causes a huge amount of costs. So there's that kind of thing going. And in fact, uh, in Europe, in uh, Belgium and Germany, they now have a paint based on this technology where you never have to clean your house. The walls automatically wash and rain. So they're making big progress there. And then, of course, graphene. we have all heard about that um, and where it's going. Um, and I think it's got a huge future, but nobody's really looking at it for AUVs that I know of. Um, so now, uh, one of the other problems is we're going in these long-range vehicles like the one you see there, um, and you get these beautiful data sets. The problem is that when you start, let's say, on the left and make it to the right, it could be as much as you know weeks apart. So they put the story together. And it's not really correlated that well, right? Um, we're trying to look at a toxic bloom, and you've got several weeks between the data points. And we call this, you know, a data set that and presented at science conferences and so forth. But it really isn't temporally correlated. Um, and so, what do you want is to get out there when you have something like a toxic bloom, and then you want it temporally correlated. So time correlation is important. That tells you a better story. And so I started this project with my students also. So I now am fairly far along in this, and it looks like uh, I've got a scientist now interested in potentially doing a prototype in a small scale. Um, so this is a flying. So what this one does is it goes in a ground effect. Flies out, dives into the water, does a mission, gets back on top of the water, and it flies home. You guys think I'm crazy, but you watch it all the time in California. They call them pelicans. So, um, very, very doable. Biomimicry is something that's uh, being done all the time now. We have robotic fish, robotic sharks, robotic lobsters. Why can't we have robotic pelicans? Um, I call it sheer water because they don't like the word pelican. But that's okay. um, and so you can see I've had some in, some students do a lot of work and studies and whatnot on it. I've actually had a model built. Oops. This is out of the series. I'm sorry. Um, okay, well, I'll go past this to the areas. That's the one. So I actually had a model built and went to a tank and showed that the wings work and fly. So the CFD, the CFD is true. Um, and uh, so I've had several students now graduate doing these little incremental things and doing this analysis. I've got another idea. I took out some of the slides here. I obviously didn't put them in order. I apologize. But the idea here is to make a ring wing uh, around the body of the vehicle and then use one actuator to turn it 90 degrees and one to uh, move it laterally a little bit. So what you do is you create pressure waves across the vehicle. 
And what you can do then is some new kinds of actions. So I can do the standard actions of turning by having differentials, right? But then I can also do things like go sideways off of it at an angle with being straight. I actually don't know if there's any need for this, by the way. I really don't have an application for it. I just thought it would be fun. So I do it with my students. Um, it gives them something new to do. Um, and this is how things went with Will and the, and the guy who did the tail cone, um, which did have a real application. So um, these are the kinds of things that you want to think about and so forth and you can have some fun with as you go through your careers. I'm getting a little over time here, so I'm going to hurry. Um, we were talking about scholarships. So if you go to our website, there's two kinds that uh, we have right now. Uh, there's eight uh, scholarships at the top. Um, and they, they usually go to graduate students, but you can get them to undergraduate students if you, you know, your application comes in strong enough. Um, the new woman is in charge of it. She's making sure all eight go out now. She had a guy before who we wasn't quite getting to it. So Lisa Hartling is who you'd be talking to. And then the student pop po poster competition is at our Oceans meetings. And I think there's flyers and pins and everything out there for the Oceans meeting maybe in Monterey. If you haven't been to Monterey, it's just like here, only cooler. So, uh, well, maybe it's not just like here, but uh, so I think these are two, two areas you can get money. And uh, we've had a lot of students from Asia, uh, Israel, everywhere. So there's no, no problem there about your application. So take a look at that. I encourage you to apply. Um, and then this is something I passed on. Last year I had a different statement to try and do this for all students. But how do you think? And uh, I found this one here by Pascal, who um, once you guys measure pressure based on his principles. So, uh, but this is something he said. Put the side, imagination decides everything. So don't sit there and believe that you're sort of stuck or whatever. There's a whole future in what we're going to do with AUVs that hasn't even been imagined yet. Um, and you, the guys, are going to do it. It's time to get old. Anyway, thank you guys for being here.